Hello, and welcome to the workshop, Introduction to Chronic Graft-Versus-Host Disease. My name is Sue Stewart, and I will be your moderator today. I'd first like to thank people, organizations that have sponsored this workshop, Equilium, Cadman, a Santa Fe company, Pharmacyclics, an AbbVie company, and Janssen Biotech, Syndax, and the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, whose support made this workshop possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Amin Alusi. Dr. Alusi is a professor of medicine and the inpatient medical director of the Department of Stem Cell Transplantation at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He's also the director of the GVHD Clinic and Research Program. Dr. Alusi specializes in the treatment of graft-versus-host disease and has pioneered an innovative multidisciplinary program at MD Anderson to provide excellent care for patients living with graft versus host disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy. Thank you all for joining in today, and thank you, Sue, for the kind introduction, and more importantly, for organizing this wonderful symposium. You and that BMT InfoNet have compiled a wonderful list of topics and great speakers, and I'm thrilled to take part in this year's symposium. As you mentioned, I have the distinct honor to lead a team, a large team of physicians, advanced care providers, nurses, pharmacists, and therapists who all specialize in the care of patients with graft versus host disease. What I hope to accomplish in today's talk is to provide you the knowledge needed to be an informed and active participant in your care. Undoubtedly, at this point in your journey, you have heard of this complication of allogeneic transplantation referred to as graft versus host disease. GBHD in its simplest term is a multi-system disorder, by multi-system meaning it can involve various organs, that occurs when immune cells transplanted from a non-identical donor recognize the recipient as foreign and result in an immunologic process resulting in tissue injury, impaired organ function, which can uh, result in an impaired quality of life and in severe forms can limit survival. So what do you need to know about graft-versus-host disease? Well, in our GBHD clinic at MD Anderson, we teach three simple rules to live by. Number one, we want you to know thyself. Number two, know thy foe, and by foe, I mean graft versus host disease. And number three, make sure, make sure that thyself is never thy foe. So let's get started. Number one, what do we mean by know thyself? Well, um, very early after discharge from transplant, we teach our patients to examine their body thoroughly. Certainly, as they approach uh, day 100 uh, after the transplant or getting ready to transition back to normal life or back to their home community, we tell them that weekly we want you to examine your body, we want you to examine your mouth, look thoroughly within it, do a total skin examination, and examine your joints and, and your genitalia. We want you to pay attention to any new symptoms. Symptoms of uh, GBHD can often present as subtle changes. And if you know your body, you're gonna be the first to recognize these subtle changes long before a clinician ever does. GBHD, like any disease, is best to catch early and when interventions can be most successful and to get the best uh, uh, results and, and, uh, and outcomes. Don't be afraid to ask if something is normal. Don't assume a change or a symptom that you are experiencing is quote unquote normal following chemotherapy and transplantation. When in doubt, it's better to ask and be told it's nothing than to assume incorrectly that it's a case. So rule number two, know thy foe, no graft versus host disease. So, uh, to start with, graft versus host disease is actually two diseases, not one, it's two diseases. There's acute graft versus host disease and chronic graft versus host disease. Acute GBHD um, is recognized as affecting three main organs, uh, the 
skin is the most common organ involved by acute GVHD, and it has a very distinctive rash. That rash is described as morbilliform, which means measles-like. Or you may also hear it described as a macular papular rash. And in upcoming slides, I'll show you a picture of uh, what that rash can look like. The GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, can be involved by acute GVHD and has two distinct manifestations. Uh, there could be upper GI symptoms, where patients have persistence of nausea and vomiting or poor appetite, not wanting to eat, what we call failure to thrive. And these are symptoms that extend beyond the chemotherapy that's initially given uh, with the transplant. Um, and when these symptoms uh, persist, uh, this can be a manifestation of graft-versus-host disease. Uh, separately, patients can have lower GI involvement with a hallmark being what's called a secretory diarrhea. What's meant by secretory? Well, this is a diarrhea that persists. You can eat or not eat, you're still going to have loose, watery bowel movements. Uh, as the disease uh, is more severe, gets more severe, it can present with abdominal pain and cramping, and in its most severe form, present with frank blood in the stools. And then less commonly, acute GVHD can involve the liver, and we're going to recognize this by changes in blood chemistry, specifically abnormal liver labs, specifically uh, total bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, and sometimes ALT and AST. So, oops. Chronic GBHD, on the other hand, uh, uh, can involve many, many different organs. In fact, uh, uh, the average patient with chronic GBHD can have four different organ manifestations. Virtually every organ in the body has at least been reported as having a manifestation of chronic GBHD, but the most common organs involved include the eyes, mouth, skin, joints and fascia, gastrointestinal tract, liver, lungs, and the genitals. So historically, uh, graft-versus-host disease, uh, acute and chronic, was uh, defined as acute GVHD being that which occurred within the first 100 days of transplant and chronic GVHD, which occurred after day 100. Uh, we now know that was a simplified uh, view of these diseases. And in fact, these diseases have distinct pathophysiology and distinct manifestations, which I'll review and uh, which I uh, will review. So acute GBHD is not limited to the first 100 days of transplant. It is true that the most common uh, first signs of acute GBHD do occur early on, typically a week or two after engraftment of the white blood cells. But acute GBHD certainly can and commonly does uh, occur after day 100. So this could be a patient who has uh, initial manifestations of acute GBHD and the symptoms persist beyond day 100. Separately, this could be a patient who early on had acute GVHD, uh, received treatment, the GVHD went away, later to come back after day 100. And then separately, uh, acute GVHD can occur after day 100 in a patient who had no prior history of acute GVHD. And this is commonly seen when the immune suppressive agents are being tapered. For instance, if you're on tacrolimus or cyclosporin or serolimus and, and your provider is beginning to reduce uh, those medications in an effort to stop the prophylaxis and take the breaks off the immune cells of the donor, uh, acute GBHD can appear for the first time. Now, chronic GBHD has a median onset of five to six months after transplant for the, the uh, first manifestations. However, certainly chronic GVHD can occur before day 100. The earliest I have ever seen a patient show manifestations for chronic GVHD was as little as day 35 after transplant. But typically, again, it has a median onset of five to six months after the transplant. Importantly, 90% of patients uh, have chronic GBHD manifestations uh, within the first year of transplant. 90% will uh, patients who develop chronic GBHD will begin to show signs of it within the first year. And it's very rare for chronic GBHD to occur um, beyond two years as a, as a new onset. Um, many patients um, early on view day 100 as a finish line. So they've 
been admitted to the hospital, they've received their conditioning chemotherapy, they've been grafted, they've been discharged, they're at that interval where they're being seen frequently in the clinics, maybe on a daily basis or multiple times a week. And as they get to day 100, they're like, finally, I'm there. But actually, the day 100 is not the finish line, it's in fact the starting line. And importantly, this is a period where we put patients on high alert. This is the period where we want them to really monitor most closely for the signs and symptoms of graft-versus-host disease, and we educate them, as I'm going to do in today's talk, and what those symptoms and signs are, um, because we want them to be able to recognize them and report back. Why is day 100 to 360 such a high alert period? Well, number one, uh, commonly, patients have left the transplant center and have gone back to their home communities. They may be being seen less frequently and oftentimes by people who may be less experienced uh, in the manifestations of GBHD. Number two, it's during that period, as I mentioned, that commonly the immune suppression is being tapered and GBHD symptoms can at first appear. And then finally, as I mentioned, chronic GBHD has a median onset of five to six months post-transplant. And so this is when the disease, if it's going to occur, is likely to occur. Again, 90% of patients who develop chronic GBHD show signs of it within the first year of transplant. So day 100 to 360, you got to know what to look for and be on high alert. So what are those organ manifestations of chronic GBHD? Well, the skin, just like an acute GBHD, is the most common organ involved by chronic GBHD, followed by mouth manifestations, liver, eyes, GI tract, joints and fascia, lungs, and uh, genitalia. So we want patients to know thy skin, examine your skin. Your skin is, again, the most common organ involved by chronic GBHD as well as acute GBHD. In addition, your skin is also the most common site for secondary cancers after transplant. So skin cancers are more common to patients who are immune compromised, such as receiving an allogeneic transplant and being on immune suppressants. And so we really want you to examine your skin, do a total skin exam weekly, and have a total skin exam performed by a transplant professional and or dermatologist at least once yearly. So in medical school, uh, we learned the medical, uh, the proverb that the eyes cannot see what the brain does not know. What this means is that unless you know what you're looking for, your eyes simply won't see it. In the GBHD clinic, we've taken that a step further and we say that the eyes cannot see what the eyes cannot see. So when we examine patients, we get them out of their clothes, we put them in a robe, and we do a total skin examination, a total body examination. We look in every nook and cranny for evidence of GBHD, and we disrobe the patient. So when looking at the skin, what are you looking for? Most patients assume they're looking for rashes, and in fact, rashes are a manifestation of GBHD. By rash, we mean red, raised skin lesions or redness. Um, but oftentimes, and in fact, more times than not, chronic GBHD doesn't appear with a rash, but change in skin texture. There's scarring of the skin, or what we call cellulite-like changes, which I'll show in the upcoming pictures. Rarely, uh, chronic GBHD can present simply a swelling, swelling in the hands or the wrists, swelling in the lower extremities. Sometimes without even any changes, patients will say, you know, my skin just feels tight. I'm noticing limited mobility. It's harder for me to open jars. It's harder for me to bend my wrist. Um, it may be hard to walk upstairs or get off the floor. Uh, we tell patients to look for pigment changes, and that's darkening of the skin, what we call hyperpigmentation, or lightening of the skin, hypopigmentation. We tell them to look at their hair for changes, to examine their nails. And then, as I mentioned, because skin cancers are common to this population, we tell them pay attention to your moles, look for new moles or change in any uh, pre-existing moles. Here we see some skin rashes of GBHD. The panel, top panel to the left, the red rash that's described as macular papular, that is the acute GBHD manifestation. Other manifestations of chronic GBHD include the pictures shown here, an entity called poikloiderma, 
hallmarked by atrophy or thinning of the skin, pigment changes and small blood vessels uh, that appear on the skin, keratosis pilaris, which are look like goosebumps that persist. Uh, snake skin, ichthyosis, can be a manifestation of chronic GVHD when it appears new in patients who uh, don't have that to begin with. Like in planus, which are purple or scaly, um, uh, silvery, uh, polygonal skin lesions, um, um, uh, are, can be another manifestation of chronic GVHD. These are all r rashes of GVHD, and there's many, many more that, uh, that have been described and reported. Now, when we talk about changes in skin texture uh, and scarring, um, that's what's shown on this picture here. So if you look at the top panel that says fixed sclerosis, not only do you see a, a difference in the color of the skin and the pigment of the skin, but if you were to feel the skin within that circle area, it would feel different. It would feel leathery or thickened than the skin uh, outside that area, uh, which would have a normal feel to it. So changes in the way the skin feels. Um, the cellulite-like changes that are referred to, you, uh, this, this woman in this picture here, that's not cellulite, uh, that, was, that is actual GBHD. And what's happening is these are deposits of scar tissue in the skin, or the skin is being affixed or attached to uh, the structures below the skin, such as the fascia that line our muscles or the tendons, uh, and the structures, and the skin is being puckered uh, or pulled inwards and affixed to those structures. You can have a groove sign um, shown in the circled picture in the middle uh, on this gentleman's leg or on the arm in the circled picture on both sides up here. You can see dimpling commonly in the flank areas. Uh, for whatever reason, these manifestations often appear in areas where there may be a little bit more fat tissue, like in the abdomen or belt line, under the bra, underneath the arms. And so uh, we look closely for these changes, which initially could be quite subtle and patients can assume is just normal. Here's another manifestation of scarring or fibrosis, a fibrotic manifestation referred to as morphia, shown in the panels to the left. Pigment change, again, darkening or lightening of the skin shown in right, uh, uh, the panels to the right, that, is, that can be manifestations of chronic GBHD. With respect to the hair, uh, there's many reasons why the hair can thin after the transplant. There's a lot of non-GBHD medical reasons why this could happen. And we, of course, want you to report those changes. You shouldn't assume it's normal. But the, you can also have scare, uh, hair loss specifically from GBHD and scarring of the scalp. And often this is irreversible. Um, uh, the, the scalp is scarred and there's some hair loss shown in the, in the patients in the panels to the right. With respect to the nails, what are we looking for? Well, early on, you may see what is called longitudinal ridging shown in the pictures to the left. Uh, you can have um, fragility to the nails. They can split, uh, have nail splitting at the edges. Um, they can get caught on things very easily. Um, those are early manifestations of GBHD that involves the nails. In later stages of that, uh, you get scarring of the nail bed, and then ultimately complete loss of the nails, which is permanent, um, shown in the pictures to the right. As I mentioned, uh, we pay attention to moles because skin cancers are so frequent uh, following allogeneic transplants and immune suppressed patients um, are at higher risk for these skin cancers. So we want patients to pay attention to moles, moles that are new, moles that are changing. We teach patients the importance of using uh, sun protectants, whether it be protective hats with a wiper in um, or protective clothing, using um, sunscreens with SPF greater than 30, and then just frankly avoiding laying out in the sun or peak sun hours because not only are, are, are you at higher risk of skin cancers, but sun exposure has been linked with flares in GVHD and, um, and uh, no one, but let alone a transplant patient, should uh, um, you know, lay in the sun. Um, as I mentioned, it's important to see a dermatologist, uh, ideally once a year. If you have a prior history of skin cancer, uh, more like twice a year would be the standard recommendation. 
For more information about GBHD of the skin, there's a number of resources. I want to um, point out that uh, May 3rd at 2.45, my uh, distinguished colleague, uh, Sharon Himes, who's a dermatologist uh, who I've worked with in the past 20 years at MD Anderson, she's been caring for patients with GBHD for 40 plus years, and she's a tremendous resource and knowledgeable source of information about uh, skin conditions following allogeneic transplant. Other resources include Be the Match, where they have a screening uh, information sheet for screening for chronic GBHD of the skin, as well as Fast Facts. Uh, this is a sheet that provides a quick uh, lowdown information on what you need to know when screening for uh, chronic GBHD of the skin. Uh, importantly, at the end of today's uh, talk, I have compiled a list of resources for all the various organs that can be involved, as well as general information about GBHD, where you can get more information. And I'm not going to take the time to review those uh, after each organ, but I'll uh, have you come back later if you would like those, and, and, and you can uh, download that information. So um, chronic GBHD of the mouth, what should you look for? A symptom of, dry, of dry, a dry mouth is a symptom of chronic GBHD. Now, there's many reasons why patients can have dry mouth following allogeneic transplant. Medications can cause the mouth to be dry, but one manifestation or symptom of GBHD of the mouth uh, can be dry mouth. Sometimes patients report early on a rough sensation to the mouth. It kind of feels like that sensation you get when you eat something too hot, scalded mouth sensation, I call it. Some patients may report, uh, commonly patients with chronic GBHD report, painless, small, fluid-filled lesions that come and go throughout the day depending on what they eat. These are called mucoceles. I'll show you a picture of that in the upcoming slide. A common symptom of patients who have oral GBHD is new sensitivity to foods. These are spicy foods or acidic foods, toothpaste, carbonated beverages. When the patient uh, eat or eats or exposed to these uh, items, they, the mouth and the, the mucosa of the mouth becomes very sensitive and they don't tolerate it. Uh, patients can have swelling, redness, pain, or bleeding of the gums, and they can ultimately develop ulcers in their mouth and, of course, pain and, and result in weight loss from not wanting to eat because of the pain. Here we see pictures of oral GBHD. Uh, the circle panel to the left shows uh, uh, the buccal surface, the inner cheek surface showing what is called lichen planus-like lesions. These are the lacy white striations shown along the inner part of this uh, patient's mouth. Under the tongue, you can see these white striations in the pa upper panel in the middle. You can see these white striations on the roof of the mouth in the panel, uh, middle panel on the, uh, at the bottom. Um, if you look closely, you can see tiny little small fluid-filled blisters Again, these are the mucoceles that come and go throughout the day and are commonly seen in patients who have chronic GBHD of the mouth. As I mentioned, redness and ulceration are some of the severe manifestations of chronic GBHD of the mouth and associated pain with these lesions. Chronic GBHD of the eyes, what are you looking for? Well, early on, patients actually can report excessive tearing. Um, but with time, uh, chronic GBHD of the eyes presents with decreased tearing the eyes feel dry, they're, they're burning, they're gritty. It feels like they have sand in the eye or a foreign object sensation in the eye. They may itch, the eyelids may itch, and in the morning they may have discharge with the eyes being crusted over in the morning. Other uh, commonly is sensitivity to light and or wind. And then uh, diminished visual acuity and blurred vision because the tears uh, is actually uh, important in, in, in how we see and when there's diminished tear production from uh, chronic GBHD of the eyes, uh, visual acuity can be uh, impaired. Chronic GBHD of the GI tract, what are you looking for? Well, anorexia, no desire to eat, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, bloating, cramping, diarrhea. Sometimes the diarrhea is gr greasy stools with undigested food material, maybe a, a symptom of chronic GBHD of the GI tract. Uh, painful swallowing, swallowing can be a symptom. Uh, one of the hallmarks of, uh, of chronic GBHD of the GI tract is uh, narrowing of the food pipe of the esophagus, uh, what we call strictures, which result in difficulty swallowing dry foods and pills, and as it progresses, difficulty swallowing even liquids. 
Ultimately, the various manifestations of GDHD can result in weight loss. We ask our patients to weigh themselves closely, and we ourselves monitor the weights over time. Because uh, while many things can cause weight loss, GBHD is a, a common uh, cause during the post late uh, post transplant period. What about GBHD that involves the joints, fascia, and muscles? If you're looking for joint stiffness, reduced range of motion, tightness in the muscles and tendons. One of the more common uh, complaints that patients who have chronic GBHD is, uh, is they experience severe muscle cramps, that Charlie horse sensation. Sometimes they have spasms where their fingers or toes are in a locked position for a couple of minutes and it just subsides on its own and can be quite painful. In severe forms of chronic GBHD involving the joints and fascia, the joints are in a contracted uh, flex position with the inability to straighten them, as I'll show in the upcoming pictures. Rarely, swelling alone can be a manifestation of chronic GBHD, and even rarer, you can sometimes have fluid within the joints and pain associated with that as a presentation of chronic GBHD of the joints. Here we see a tool that we use in characterizing and monitoring over time patients' uh, joint mobility. This is called the PROM scores. This is a tool that we do at each visit when we're screening and examining patients uh, for chronic GVHD. So uh, numbers uh, seven in the top three uh, rows is a normal range of motion. And, uh, and for the ankle, a uh, number of four is normal. And so if we go to the top row and look at the shoulders, um, a, a person should be able to do what's called a touchdown sign, a uh, touchdown where they raise their arms straight above their shoulders. Um, obviously, people can have shoulder injuries or arthritis or rotator cuff that causes impairment. But when you have chronic GBHD that involves the skin underneath the armpit, or in the arm, under the arm, or along the chest wall, uh, the skin is tightened and there's a tightness that results in impaired ability to raise the arms above the shoulders. And as that skin gets tighter, it becomes more impaired and becomes, uh, with the lower numbers, the complete inability to raise their arms above their head. We will look at the elbow um, as the structures, the skin, the joints, the fascia become uh, involved proximal to the uh, elbow. Um, there can be a progressive flexion of the arm, inability to straighten the arm uh, due to that scar tissue and formation. Uh, we teach all the patients at day 90 or so that when they go home uh, to their home community, every week we want them to do what's called a prayer sign. And the prayer sign is showed in this third row here. The prayer sign is for the wrist. Normally, one should be able to bend the wrist and hand to a 90 degree angle and uh, make that prayer-like uh, 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 motion. Um, but when there's a early sign of chronic GVHD, it can be tightness and inability uh, where you're unable to get to that 90 degrees. And as it progresses and gets more scarred and, and more uh, leads to contractures, you can see in the panels one and two for the wrist and hands, this patient has an inability to straighten their fingers. They can't make the clapped hand uh, uh, motion. They can't put their hands flat together um, because their fingers are contracted in a flexed position. Similarly, they can't bend the wrist. The wrist is, uh, in panels one and two, are completely inability to bend the wrist. It's contracted. Ankle, similarly shown in the bottom. Inability to raise the foot off the floor. Here we see uh, patients uh, with uh, chronic GBHD involved in joints and fascia. The panel to the left, this is a patient of mine. This was his first manifestation of chronic GBHD, impaired prayer sign. This is new for him. He used to be able to do this to a seven, but he's now having impairment and, and would have a PROM score of a five. Here's a patient in the middle with more severe involvement with a PROM score of four. And then this is one of my patients who has severe chronic GBHD. And you can see he has a complete inability to straighten his fingers. He cannot even make his hands flat against each other. And the wrists are scarred to the point where he can't bend at the wrist. Here we see another patient, inability to straighten his arm or raise his arms above his head because of uh, skin and joint and fascia tightness, um, um, respectively. 
What about chronic GBH of the lungs? What are you looking for? Well, a symptom can be a dry cough. It can be wheezing. Um, sometimes chronic GVHD develops after having a cold, with, after exposure to certain viruses. And so normally a cold should last uh, one or two weeks, but uh, oftentimes a hallmark of chronic GVHD is that cold that just never gets better, just continued cough that extends beyond one or two weeks. And it's now going on three, four, six weeks. Um, that may be a sign of chronic GVHD of the lungs. Uh, as the uh, disease process progresses, patients can have shortness of breath. Um, uh, commonly, patients early on will say that they feel like they can't take a deep breath, they can't expand their lungs, can't get air into their lungs. Um, but most commonly, uh, patients are asymptomatic, they have no symptoms, and, and this is why uh, screening is so important. Uh, this is why we screen for GBHD of the lungs. So uh, what, do we are, what are we measuring when we do pulmonary function tests? We're measuring the flow of air into our lungs with inhalation and out of our lungs with exhalation. And the hallmark of GBHD of the lungs is an inability or impaired ability to get the air out of our lungs. And because our lungs are filled with air and we have air trapping, uh, when we take a deep breath in, it feels tight. It feels like we can't get that, all that air in because there's already air trapped in the lungs. Um, this could be one of the most serious forms of chronic GVHD and, and can uh, result in, in uh, limited survival. And this is why we believe that it's so important to catch this early. Sometimes we can't improve the pulmonary function test, but if we can catch it early and stabilize things with treatment and prevent it from getting worse, um, this is important for outcomes. Who's at highest risk for chronic GVHD of the lungs? Well, patients who are at higher highest risk are those who have chronic GVHD that involve other organs, you know, the, scot, the skin, the eyes, the joints, et cetera. They're at highest risk for developing subsequent lung GVHD. As I mentioned earlier, uh, GVHD can be triggered by certain community respiratory viruses, specifically RSV, respiratory essential virus, which is a common uh, cold-like virus. Parainfluenza, another common uh, cold-like virus can also uh, uh, trigger GVHD at the lungs. So being careful during exposures in your community uh, to these rest common community respiratory viruses are so important. So how do we screen? Again, we screen by pulmonary function tests, uh, and we screen because we want to catch this early and stop progression. And so uh, patients are screened with routine pulmonary function tests that should be done uh, certainly the uh, within the first two years of transplant, serially within the first two years, maybe three years of transplant. And if you have chronic GVHD involving other organs, active chronic GVHD, we often screen with PFTs beyond three years. Importantly, at MD Anderson and other cancer centers, we're studying um, these new devices where patients can monitor at home. So this is a handheld device that does a simplified form of pulmonary function test. And the data is, uh, is transmitted remotely back to the transplant center and alarm goes off uh, and alerts the providers back at the transplant center that there's new changes, new impairment that may be consistent with a patient uh, manifesting chronic GVHD of the lungs. Patients will do this on a daily or weekly basis, and that information is transmitted back. And if uh, changes are seen, the patient's brought back for more formal testing. What about genitals uh, for females? And I'm going to warn uh, uh, the audience that the upcoming uh, slides do show pictures of male and female genitalia. Um, so for females, the external and internal, ex, uh, internal uh, genitalia can be involved. The vulva can be involved. We uh, tell patients to look for areas of redness, focal areas of white plaques or thinning. We tell patients to examine the, eternal, the internal vaginal mucosa using a hand mirror. We want, to look, want them to look to see if the, the tissue is uniform in color, no areas of redness, white striations, scar tissue, adhesions, loss of elasticity, and ultimately narrowing of the vaginal canal. Symptoms can include itching, burning, dryness, painful intercourse, pain with urination and bleeding. Now, many things can present with those symptoms, not just GVHD, but if you have those symptoms, report them. Don't assume it's normal. Um, sometimes clinicians forget to ask about these symptoms, and unless you report it, uh, we won't know. 
and importantly, we should refer you to either a pelvic floor therapist or a gynecologist experienced in what to look for uh, to see if this is uh, indeed from GBHD or not. Here we see a picture on the next slide of, uh, it's hard to see somewhat, but on the slide to the picture to the left, you're seeing white lacy striations on the labia minora uh, with more severe manifestations. Labia minora becomes affixed um, and is, uh, you have adhesions. In the most severe manifestations of chronic GBHD involving the genitalia, there's complete scarring and closing of the vaginal canal and um, this can be quite debilitating. And of course, we want to catch this early. For men, uh, men can also experience GBHD of the genitalia. We tell the patient to examine the, the head of the penis or the glands of the penis. Is it uniform in color? No areas of redness or white striations, burning or painting. We tell them uh, to retract the foreskin. It should retract easily and without pain. No areas of scar tissue and adhesions. Um, Pain and burning at the head of the penis is a symptom. Very, very rarely, uh, uh, GVHD of the genitalia can result in scarring of the where the urine comes out, the hiatus, and impaired urinary flow. And in patients who have uh, 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 scar-like tissue, uh, like sclerodermal GVHD, they can actually depend a develop a, a bend to the penis when it's erect. And this is a rare manifestation of uh, GVHD of the genitalia. Here we see a picture of uh, GVHD uh, affecting the glands of the penis, the white area of striations and redness. This patient was told by a home provider that this was a yeast infection, when indeed this is a manifestation of GVHD. I forgot to mention earlier, but for females, uh, one of the closest associations uh, for, for development of GVHD of the vaginal mucosa are those who have oral GVHD. And so if you have oral GVHD, um, clinicians and patients should be at heightened uh, alert to look for vaginal involvement as well. What about labs? Well, labs are important monitoring for chronic GBHD, uh, particularly important when we're tapering immune suppression. Routinely, we get labs at least monthly between days 100 to 365 to look for lab manifestations of GVHD. We pay attention to the liver function tests, including the ALT or ASD, the alkaline phosphatase, and total bilirubin. Sometimes there can be other clues for chronic GVHD. One uh, finding that can be seen in patients with chronic GVHD is an elevation of a certain type of white blood cell called the eosinophil. So uh, increase of the absolute increase in numbers of these white blood cells can be seen in patients with chronic GVHD. Uh, rarely, but uh, can happen, is an immune mediated fall in the neutrophils or platelet count that happens in patients with GVHD, and so we monitor for that as well. So I said rule number three was don't let thyself become thy foe. And what do I mean by that? Well, take your medications. They are vitally important for preventing and treating GVHD. I can tell you um, a, a number of patients over the 20 years I've been caring for pa uh, patients uh, in the transplant setting who have stopped, it, stopped prematurely without consulting their physician, their medications, and developed horrific uh, GVHD and ultimately died from GVHD. So never stop your medications. Take them consistently as prescribed. Monitor and report, as I've mentioned. Don't assume anything is normal. Report something you're experiencing. We better, it's better to report and being told it's nothing to worry about than to catch something late. When feasible, travel to see a transplant provider and subspecialists who, are best, who best know and can treat GVHD. Uh, I understand this can be costly and difficult, and I know it may not be feasible for everyone, but really uh, seeing providers who know GBHD and know what to look for is so vitally important. Don't resist taking therapy or doing therapy that's required to treat your GBHD, such as steroids. Um, often patients uh, come to my GBHD clinic. Uh, they're at that point where their clinician has begun to stop some of their medications, and they come to see me and they have GBHD, and I tell them, oh, we got to start steroids and start all the, resume these other medicines, and, they, and they're, they're frustrated. They don't want to do it. They're at that point where they were hoping to stop medications, not start new ones, but these medicines are important to stop the GBHD, restore normal um, organ function, and, and ultimately to improve survival. 
Other therapies is just equally important to our systemic treatment, what we call supportive care. So each organ that has GBHD, there's a whole list of supportive care that's done to improve symptoms and quality of life with uh, in patients who have that organ manifestation. For instance, if you have severe dryness of the eyes from ocular GBHD, we may give topical agents to help. Uh, we may will tell you to use artificial tears. Uh, ophthalmologists may uh, uh, cauterize or put plugs in the ducts that drain the tears so they can pull in your eyes and, and help treat those symptoms of dryness. In severe patients, we give them specialized lenses that trap moisture into the eyes and help treat the symptoms. But each organ has uh, supportive care measures that are done uh, to help improve organ functionality and improve quality of life, and they're equally important. Oftentimes, especially in our patients who have uh, skin and sclerotic manifestations of GBHD, joint and fascial involvement, we refer them to occupational therapy and physical therapy. They have gentle involvement, pelvic floor therapy, and these therapists are highly, highly trained and, and can do wonders to improve and restore function. Nutritional support is so important as well. What about systemic treatment? Well, the hallmark of treatment, the standard treatment is steroids, either in the form of prednisone or methylprednisolone. This is a first line treatment for both acute and chronic GBHD. Um, patients, though, uh, sometimes don't get better with the steroids and are refractory, or they get better and the, and, and the disease comes back as we taper the steroids and we call that steroid dependent. Maybe as much as half the patients with chronic GVHD will have steroid dependent or, or uh, refractory GVHD. What do we do in those cases? Well, for acute GVHD to start with, there is currently one FDA approved therapy for patients who have steroid refractory acute GVHD, and that's ruxolitinib. It also goes by the name Jacify or Jacophy. Um, this is the only FDA approved therapy for patients with steroid refractory acute. There are new therapies being studied, and it's so important that patients get involved in clinical trials because they can benefit from these new therapies, just like uh, um, Jacophy benefited patients. Um, for chronic GBHD, there's three FDA-approved therapies. As little as six or seven years ago, there was no FDA-approved therapies, but through clinical trial, we now have three drugs available for patients with steroid refractory chronic GBHD. That's abrutinib or abruvica, belumosidil, ruxolitinib, uh, again called uh, Jacophy, belumosidil goes by the name Resuroc. And there's a number of other agents that aren't FDA approved but are commonly used to help patients with chronic GVHD, shown here. Again, a number of new exciting drugs that are being studied, and it's so important to participate in clinical trials if you have the ability. Abrutinib, as I mentioned, uh, this is the first FDA approved therapy for patients with steroid refractory chronic. Uh, it works by inhibiting the immune cells that drive chronic GVHD. It was studied in patients 18 years and older who failed to respond to steroids and had either a red rash or oral GVHD. And in these patients, 67% of the patients had a GVHD response, and roughly 25% of them had a meaningful improvement uh, in symptoms and quality of life using validated measuring tools for that. Side effects of abrutinib include a uh, 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 hospitalization for infection. So a third of the patients who participated in the trial uh, developed an infection requiring hospitalization. Fatigue can be seen in patients with GVHD, but fatigue can also be a side effect of abrutinib. Diarrhea, a third of the patients on the trial reported diarrhea. Sometimes a lower dose of abrutinib is used uh, to avoid these side effects. Belumosidil, Resuroc, uh, this was just approved last year for patients failing more than two lines of prior therapies. It's a first-of-its-kind drug. It works by targeting a, a unique pathway called ROC2, ROC2 protein. It inhibits. Um, and uh, inhibition of this pathway is believed to take the immune milieu of the patient from this inflammatory milieu to one of a tolerogenic or tolerizing milieu. In addition, uh, this pathway is felt uh, to be important for uh, in causing fibrosis, and when we inhibit it, we may stop or improve fibrosis. It's studied in patients 12, it was studied in patients 12 years and older with very, very advanced and severe forms of chronic GVHD. These patients had failed many lines of prior therapy. And in this study, 74% of the patients had a measurable GVHD response, and roughly 60% 
reported improvement in uh, quality of life on uh, validate, using validated tools to measure symptoms. Side effects, 10% of required, had an ammonia that required hospitalization, 20% elevated liver enzymes. Fatigue was reported, again, in half the patients. Again, this could be from GVHD or perhaps from the medications. Nausea or diarrhea reported in about a third of the patients. Finally, ruxolitinib was FDA approved uh, uh, recently, just this past year, in patients failing one or more prior therapies. As I mentioned, it was previously approved for patients with steroid refractory acute GVHD and then became FDA approved uh, uh, for chronic GVHD, again, that failed one or more lines. This was the only of these three agents that was studied in what we call a randomized trial. So half the patients on the trial received ruxolitinib or Jacopy as it's called. The other half received a handful of uh, other options. And head-to-head -head comparison was done in these patients 12 years and older with moderate and severe chronic GVHD. And 50% of the patients who got uh, the Jacopy or the ruxolitinib report had a measurable response improvement in their GVHD versus 25% who received the other best available therapies. 25% uh, of the patients who got ruxolitinib or Jacopy had a meaningful improvement in symptoms and quality of life versus 11% with control arm. Side effects of Jacopy may include infections. Um, pneumonia requiring hospitalization was seen in 8.5% of the patients on that trial. Jacopy or ruxolitinib is known to cause subcount suppression including anemia, lowering of platelets, or uh, lowering of the neutrophils. And so monitoring blood counts when patients receive this drug is vitally important. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and take any questions. I'd like to thank the team that I have at MD Anderson who sees patients with me uh, in the GBHD clinic. Um, I'm so proud of them. Many of them will be speaking at this symposium and they are, are so dedicated to helping patients and I've learned so much for them. Here you see some of them shown in the picture here. And again, I just want to remind everybody that at the end of this talk, uh, I've included a list of information and resources you can turn to for more information about GBHD, as well as the various organ manifestations. And with that, I'll stop and turn the floor over to Sue, uh, Sue who can direct me to any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lucy, for that very thorough talk. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. We'll start with the first one from a woman who said she's an eight-year survivor of an allogeneic stem cell transplant, <clears throat> and she's still dealing with sensitive tongue and occasionally decreased saliva. She's wondering whether the sensitivity to textures, spices, acidic foods will ever go away because she longs to eat a crunchy cracker without having to deal with the aftermath. Uh, can you respond to that, please? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we call that the crun crunchy cracker test to detect a GBHD. If you give a patient a cracker and they can't swallow it, then that could be a sign of GBHD. Um, so it can be uh, uh, symptoms that can last for some time. There are therapies that can improve it. There's a number of therapies that uh, my oral uh, uh, Specialists will be presenting in his talk. Dr. Vince Warren is giving them a talk. But there are therapies that can help improve um, uh, saliva production. These are drugs that promote um, uh, saliva production and are generally pretty well tolerated. Maybe about 40% of the patients report improvement. They're over-the-counter agents that can also promote saliva production. Uh, if your mouth gets very sensitive to those uh, agent, uh, you know, food exposures, um, this can flare, and so using topical steroids during an acute flare or following, a, you know, a, a night of, you know, indulging in those foods uh, with the little topical steroids can help quell those symptoms. And so please speak to your providers um, about uh, things that can benefit you. Uh, I can take the next question. Sure. Uh, can you discuss muscle cramping a bit more? Why does that occur? What is helpful treatment? For example, muscle cramping in the hands. Yes, a very, very, very common complaint for patients with GVHD, and one we know very, very little about. Not a lot has been studied about it. Uh, there are stretches that help the, prevent uh, the um, 
cramping, especially at nighttime. There are exercises and, and avoidances, uh, things to avoid, like having the sheets on you in a certain way to prevent those spasms. Sometimes low doses of Norovask, a blood pressure medicine, can be used. Sometimes uh, medicines that are used for muscle spasms, like Flexeril, um, can be used, but it can be very, very challenging and, and, and really frustrating for both the patient and the provider to treat. I'm sorry you're experiencing that. All right, thank you. Um, the next person wants to know whether there's any particular area of the body, area of the skin, where you most commonly see GVHD. Yeah, great question. So for whatever reason, GVHD often can develop in areas uh, where there's a little bit more fatty tissue or areas of constriction. So underneath the bra uh, line, the waistband area, underneath the arms. That's why it's so important to disrobe when you see your provider so we can look in those areas. Um, those are common uh, skin areas to develop the fibrotic or scar-like tissue, GVHD. Um, Otherwise, it can involve any uh, area of the body, any area of the skin. All right. Uh, the next person says that uh, she has a red and swollen tip of the tongue, wants to know if this might be a symptom of GVHD. It can be, um, but it also might not be. And so um, there are conditions that result in um, trauma to the tip of the tongue and the entity, I think uh, Dr. Vince Warren shows in his talk, and I encourage her to tune into his talk uh, that's upcoming in this series. Uh, but if there's trauma, you can develop this entity that's called TUGSI. It's an acronym for a condition. So I really would encourage her to see somebody, an oral health specialist, who can uh, examine that area and see if it's from GVHD. If it's from GVHD, sometimes injection of steroids to that area can promote healing and uh, get resolution of that. But you would first want to make sure that uh, that's GVHD. All right. The next person wants to know whether you've seen restasis help ocular GVHD. Uh, there is reports that it does help. Um, my personal uh, belief is if patients haven't reported improvement after a few months of taking it, um, I don't continue it indefinitely. Um, it can sometimes sting and burn as they're putting it in. And unless there is some uh, measurable improvement with its use, I don't use it indefinitely. It is commonly prescribed by the ophthalmology community, restasis and other drugs in that class. Um, but um, it's kind of hit or miss whether it works. And if it doesn't, I don't believe in continuing it indefinitely. All right. Uh, this gentleman wants to know if there's any special physiotherapy that can help him recover the range of motion and strengthen his limbs. Oh, I'm so happy you asked that question. So occupational therapy, skilled occupational therapists um, um, have tremendous tools which can result in improvement. At uh, MD Anderson, we, I have a wonderful occupational therapist who's going to be giving a talk during the symposium, and she actually makes devices. Uh, uh, these are casts that you can put on and off to help uh, improve range of motion. You would wear them at initially maybe at nighttime for a couple of hours, and uh, then we make new cast to, to, uh, to get further improvement. And so, yes, yeah, seeing an occupational therapist, um, if, they're, if your oc local occupational therapist uh, is not familiar with that, um, I've had my occupational therapist reach out to community occupational therapists and, and teach them some of the things uh, that can be done in patients such as yourself. Great. And she will do, be doing a presentation on Friday if people want to see that. Uh, the next question is, this individual has a lot of dizziness after a uh, stem cell transplant. That was six months ago. Wants to know whether that might be a symptom of GVHD or medicine that they're taking. Yeah, not commonly a symptom of GVHD of itself. There's many things that can result in dizziness or feeling of lightheadedness when you go from sitting to standing. Yes, medications can do that. Uh, but no, that would not be a classic symptom or presentation of GVHD. All right. Uh, this individual had cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, COP, and went on a vent. She got better, and then it happened again 10 days later, and she went back on the vent uh, and in a rotoprone bed. What's the probability that this is going to happen again? 
so cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is not um, the hallmark of lung GVHD. It can be seen in patients who have graft-versus-host disease, but in and of itself, it's not a disease-defining manifestation. It can be seen in people outside of transplant and uh, patients who receive chemotherapy and never had a transplant. But yes, uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia can um, have flares and recur, and immune suppressant drugs like steroids are used, and it can come back. And so um, uh, pulmonologists, there's many pulmonologists, uh, most pulmonologists are familiar with this entity and can review with you options to try to prevent recurrences and monitoring for improvement. All right. This person says, as a person of African and Caribbean descent, how might you suggest I address dermatological issues and GVHD with my medical professionals? I feel as though things are being missed. Yeah, that is, I'm sorry you feel that way, but the approach is the same. Uh, we need to do a total skin examination um, and, um, and you know, the changes that are seen in patients with GVHD can be easily recognized in people with pigment uh, uh, as well as, you know, fair-skinned people. In fact, sometimes it's easier to recognize those changes in people with pigment because some of the um, uh, immune inflammatory responses cause either increased pigmentation or decreased. And, and so there's nothing you um, uh, that should inherently be different on how they approach you than they approach anyone. And the key is doing a thorough, dedicated skin examination. And if possible, seeing a, a, a dermatologist or a transplant specialist familiar with graft versus host disease. All right. And I think this will need to be our last question. Uh, have you seen any improvement in chronic GVHD in the wrists with manual therapy, for example, myofascial release massage? Absolutely. Um, that and other therapies which occupational therapists employ. Again, I would uh, highly encourage you, uh, Carly uh, 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 Posey, who's Capozo. giving the who's given the talk uh, later this week as an occupational therapist, and I've learned so much from her. You can't believe how specialized she is and informative she is. And yes, there is therapies, including what you uh, state, the myofascial release, that can help that manifestation. Well, thank you. I wish we could finish with all of the questions, but our time has run out. I want to thank uh, BMT Infonet and our partners, and thank you, Dr. Lucy, and you, the audience, for some excellent questions and an excellent presentation. I know we've learned a lot from this presentation, and if you'd like to go back and see it again, it will be available for viewing in the next hour or two through the rest of the week simply by going back to the BMT Infinet Symposium website and clicking on the view button. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone, and thank you for your time.